Are all technological advancements and our expanding knowledge always good for us? Does it inevitably lead to our downfall? Life in the modern world paradoxically shows that human and technological advancements can halt civilization's progress while at the same time catalyzing it. For example, on the one hand things are made easier for us but at the cost of ecosystems, the well-being of our nature and our living standards. What is the significance of culture, faith, science, history and knowledge to civilization? A well-known French philosopher would always encourage forensically examining history with a view to going back and seeing ways of doing things that were perhaps superior to how we do them now. History and knowledge being a storehouse for good ideas for us to think about. Is religion and faith indicative of a more primitive civilization? Why is it that we return to such a way of life when we lose our history, body of knowledge and culture in the game's world? Horizon Zero Dawn invites the player to think about how knowledge and our technological advancement can enable us to flourish, but at the same time bring about our own demise. It explores whether a second civilization that has another opportunity to start from zero again will do things differently from the first, even if all the collected knowledge from the previous civilization has been erased, for reasons we'll go into. It shows that among all evils humankind has endured or inflicted, we can still overwhelmingly triumph through them in hopes we make a better world. But before we truly begin, let us quickly examine and explore the world of Horizon Zero Dawn. The game is set in a world where a technologically advanced civilization has disappeared. We see an earth where nature has reclaimed the land, but with a twist. An ecosystem of machines also inhabit the lands, and are getting increasingly hostile towards human beings. What the inhabitants of the new world call as the derangement. The game at a glance may appear straightforward and simple with its plot themes and story, but once you play the game fully, you realise that there were plenty more mysteries and depth in the game's story. Quick overview of the origins, 2064. Farah Automated Solutions was one of a handful of corporations that were leading the robotics industry, developing robots for almost all walks of life. Its core business would consist of military and defense contracts. As of 2063, it will become the number one industry in the robotics sector and Fortune 100. In 2042, Farah begins marketing a series of environmentally friendly robot systems to help environmental cleanup and detoxification efforts. This is something Elizabeth was really keen about and adamantly believed in, using technological innovation for the good of the world. But in 2048, Farah opens up its military branch, making robotics that would serve as weapons of war. It is at this moment that Elizabeth Sobek, one of the top scientists at Farah, leaves in protest, as it's a move away from the green robotics to automated defense systems. It is worth mentioning that Elizabeth cared about and genuinely loved the world, which makes the player wonder why she could have such a belief given the tough times and socio-economic problems of that era. The pre-existing world of the civilization is generally painted in a negative light, with a confluence of high-tech and low life. Those that work for these high-tech robotic conglomerates also suffer from relative poverty, deprivation and a lack of protection of their basic employment rights. You can pick up collectibles of an adult in the game reflecting on tough decisions his mother made during his childhood in order for her to bring him up without a father figure. You hear a heartbreaking story of how a child's mother would continually make sacrifices with no positive outcome, slowly being brought to ruin by the cruel harsh world, not really understanding the hardship until the boy matured and writes about it in one of the optional collectibles or vantage points uh, to be more specific. This is a collectible or thing you can go about getting in the world. Despite all the harshness his mother went through, we learn of a resilience and willingness for her to smile even under such dire circumstances. We learn from his mother's experiences that she was exploited by her employer following a serious injury at work, which worsened her deteriorating health and made living difficult, especially with tough socio-economic circumstances at the time. It was heartbreaking reading the cries of regret and despair from the child, who would recall on the angry, confused and rebellious outburst he would inflict on his mother, who made choices he did not like, not knowing why as he was only a child at the time. His mother, who tried so hard to help him conquer his drug addiction and lead him on the right path, failed in her hopes of bringing him up in the cruel world, eventually parting with him as her condition ends her life. The collectibles and data points in the game unveil some harsh truths about the previous civilization, 
Although the previous civilization was technologically advanced, it appears that people often overlooked things and lost sight of the issues we ought to address. It appears that this civilization did not do well in terms of the well-being of humans. The game paints a pre-existing world that has lots of similarity to ours. Ancient media and collectibles show a world that has a spectrum of political views, seriously worsening climate problems, which have also worsened the refugee crisis at the time. In 2053, it became self-evident that the military market is the most lucrative and dominant industry, especially with FAS's automated defense platforms. Despite the many struggles of the previous world, what ended up becoming important? Combat technology, machines built to fight and kill efficiently, remotely, faster, and be self-sufficient and operable. Fast forward to the events of 2064, October 31st, Ted Farah, founder of FAS, meets up with Elizabeth Sobek to discuss a rapidly worsening crisis concerning the chariot line of peacekeepers. It's a line of machines that they were building, which are no longer responding to commands. It appears that following a glitch, the machines have become sentient and disobedient. The glitch and sudden hostility from the robots would be referred to as the Pharaoh Swarm. Elizabeth confirms to Ted that the machines have gone rogue and are rapidly multiplying due to their advanced replication and biomatter refueling systems. Yes, they've made robots that can consume all biomass as a way of self-sustaining and self-replicating. The idea here was to make machines that could be fully self-sufficient after they were deployed. Elizabeth estimates that the world has 15 months left until the swarm kills everything and everyone. In her desperate attempts to come up with a solution, she proposes Project Zero Dawn, which is also hinted at in the title of the game. General Aaron Herz and the Joint US Chiefs of Staff inside US Robotics Command are to assist with the execution of this project. Operation Enduring Victory is another accompanying plan made to assist with this. Operation Enduring Victory As military victory against the Farah Swarm was impossible, the plan called for a massive investment in conventional military equipment, immune to any hacking, which would be distributed to the civilian population unable to serve in the military. The plan also called for tactics that would delay the swarm enough for Project Zero Dawn to be completed. Among such tactics, General Herz implemented a propaganda campaign in which the human population was lied to, making them believe that Project Zero Dawn was a super weapon that would stop the Pharaoh Swarm. General Harris, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States of America. I'm sure you've heard the rumors that Zero Dawn is a top secret super weapons program. The technological miracle that will save us from the Pharaoh Plague if Operation Enduring Victory can hold off the robots long enough. The reason I'm sure you've heard the rumors is that I'm the one who spread them, and they are all lies. Zero Dawn is not a super weapons program, and it will not save us. Nothing will save us. Here's why. By the time the glitch was noticed, it was already too late. Nothing could stop the Pharaoh Plague. Nothing can. Its robots will continue to replicate and devour the biosphere. Life on Earth will be destroyed. Our planet reduced to a barren sphere. Global extinction is inevitable. No matter how many we kill, the robots just keep exponentially making more. If we had their deactivation codes, we could shut them all down, the entire swarm. But since their cryptographic protocols use polyphasic entangled waveforms, cracking a code set would take half a century. At best, we've got 16 months. Not exactly what you'd call a survival option. The destruction of a biosphere is not the sort of apocalypse you can wait out in a fallout shelter or a space station. There will be no Earth left to reclaim. Just a lifeless, toxic rock with several million pharaoh robots on it, hibernating, waiting for something to eat. This is the horrible truth behind the lies of Operation Enduring Victory. My lies. Lies designed to inspire millions of innocents to sacrifice themselves in battle. Why? One reason. To buy time for you and the work you will do here. Zero day. The day that life on Earth ceases to exist is coming fast. It cannot be stopped. The hope of zero dawn 
is that something new might come after. But I will leave it to Elizabeth Sobek to shine that thin ray of light into the darkness. Harris, out. Operation Enduring Victory was a massive delaying tactic that had humanity fight against the Pharah Swarm to their demise. General Herz and the other seniors knew they had no chance of fending off the swarm and simply lied to the civilians, otherwise no one would be willing to sacrifice themselves. Our survival instinct is powerful and not everyone can overcome it for the greater good, so this was seen as a necessity. People sentenced to die for something they were not at fault for, used as pawns effectively. During Operation Enduring Victory, Elizabeth Sobek, her team and the remaining people will hold out in bunkers, shutting themselves in, working away at Project Zero Dawn, as the Pharah Swarm continues to ravish and destroy the lands. While humanity was able to push back against the Pharah Swarm on several occasions, they inevitably lost due to their sheer number of the Swarm and their ability to quickly learn after every engagement, meaning in the long run that humanity could no longer endure. However, as was planned and intended, their dying efforts bought Elizabeth Sobek and her team enough time to complete the project, cutting it close, leaving 36 hours before the swarm eradicates the world. Death toll would be in the billions, both civilian and military. Let's go on to discuss Project Zero Dawn and who or what is Gaia. Project Zero Dawn was the codename for a massive terraforming system designed to reseed life back to Earth after the complete destruction of all life on the planet and defeat of the Pharaoh Plague. Elizabeth Sobek. You've heard the bad news, and it's all true. The Pharaoh Plague is devouring the biosphere. Life itself will cease to exist. But does that have to be the end? What if we could give life a future? <coughs> what if we could build a kind of seed from which, on a dead planet, life could blossom anew? This is the aim, the hope, of Project Zero Dawn. To create a super-intelligent, <coughs> fully automated terraforming system and bring life back from lifelessness. What would such a system require? At its core, it would need a true AI, fully capable of making the trillions of decisions necessary to reconstitute the biosphere. An immortal guardian, devoted to the reflourishing of life. We call it Gaia. Mother Nature as an AI. But that's just the core of the system. She will need to be surrounded and empowered by a comprehensive suite of subordinate functions. Think of them as extensions of Gaia's mind, each dedicated to a specific purpose. Now these aren't AIs, but make no mistake, each presents an engineering challenge more profound than anything the human species has ever before attempted. Hardware that preserves and then gestates the billions of seeds and embryos from which life will be reborn. The construction of underground facilities to hold it all. And that's just the start. We don't have to build the entire system. The beauty of a fully automated terraforming system is that it can build itself. Now over the days to come, you'll learn how all these functions, all these pieces that you'll be working on, fit together. How we'll race the clock to execute our harvest initiatives, write the software, build the tech and the facilities. How we'll lock it down and seal it up before the inevitable occurs. But even more important, you'll know how it doesn't end here. How Gaia will generate those deactivation codes General Harris talked about. And build the transmission arrays to broadcast them, shutting down the feral robots for good. How Gaia will not just build, but imagine any conceivable robot it needs to do its work across centuries. From detoxifying the Earth's ravaged atmosphere and poisoned seas, to the regreening of the Earth from cryopreserved seed stocks, to rewilding the Earth with animal life. And then, when all that is done, how a new generation of human beings, spawned at cradle facilities around the globe, will partake of Apollo, the vast archive of human knowledge and cultural achievement from which they will learn of us, our world. And most important, how not to repeat our mistakes. It's not an impossible dream. 
It is within our grasp if we work tirelessly and stop at nothing to achieve it. We can't stop life from ending. But if you will help me, help Gaia, we can give it a future. Join me and help make that future real. Project Zero Dawn also entailed a massive global network of underground bunkers and automated manufacturing and cloning facilities dedicated to the reintroduction of human and animal life to a rejuvenated Earth. At the centre of the system was a hyper-powerful artificial intelligence called Gaia, who would oversee operations as long as needed. As the Pharaoh Swarm was predicted to wipe out all of life within 15 months, Project Zero Dawn was never intended to save anyone, forcing those who wish to survive to build up their own shelter and wait it out as long as they can before the inevitable. In fact, some of the highly skilled people that were invited to the bunkers committed suicide or refused out of some existential and defeated sense of purpose. Some felt that they had to rise to the call in order to preserve remnants of our humanity. Knowledge and culture, like our art for example. In the recordings, you get a little insight into what life was like in these bunkers. You hear of people being closed off from the outside world and trying to bring with them sentimental items and manifestations of the outside world for them to be archived or enjoyed indoors, realising that their former life or things that they have taken for granted would be lost to them. Gaia If you recall from the cutscene earlier, Gaia is the primary AI of the project and the core of the system. She is capable of making trillions of calculations required. Gaia's primary function was to engage in code breaking to deactivate the Pharaoh Swarm and oversee operations to make Earth eventually come back to life. Gaia's main computer core was housed inside Gaia Prime, a massive bunker holding all computer systems needed to manage the task. Gaia was assisted by nine subordinate functions, each dedicated to a single task. And those each subordinate functions were, in followers, Aether. Aether is the sub-function dedicated to detoxifying the Earth's ravaged atmosphere. Apollo. Apollo is the sub-function dedicated to the archival of human history and culture and the education of new generations of humans born in cradle facilities, with the knowledge of their achievements and failures. Artemis. Artemis is the subfunction dedicated to the creation and reintroduction of animal life onto a newly terraformed Earth. After the necessary introduction of the pioneer organisms, microorganisms, um, insects like rabbits, hawks, foxes, wolves, wild boars, and turkeys, further animal species were supposed to be restored by the new generation of humans taught correctly by Apollo. Demeter. Demeter is the subfunction dedicated to the replanting of the Earth from cryopreserved seed stocks dedicated to the cloning and raising of humans from genetic stock at specially designed and prepared cradle facilities scattered across the earth. Hades. Hades is the extinction failsafe protocol, the last resort for Gaia, which would allow it to destroy and reset the terraforming process when an undesirable outcome is detected. This is the main villain of the game and is um, what gets woken up and stops the... Um, uh, attempts to stop Gaia and the terraforming process, but we'll explain more of this later. Hephaestus is the subfunction dedicated to the construction of underground cauldron facilities that would build machines dedicated to the terraforming project. Gaia would utilize Hephaestus to design, manufacture, and deploy any machine to ensure the project's completion. The machines would then be distributed for use by the other subfunctions. This means that apart from the Pharaoh robots, the machines are part of the Gaia project. The core log found when overriding the last cauldron reveals that Hephaestus is responsible for the derangement of the machines. And if you're wondering what the derangement was, the derangement was a term used by the tribes to refer to a historically important change in the machine's default behavior towards humans, from docility and avoidance to progressively more hostile. It also refers to the appearance of progressively more dangerous machines that were built specially for combat against humans. The Nora Brave Aloy first heard of the term and its meaning used um, from the Osoram vanguard Erend when she met him at Mother's Heart the night before she ran in the Proving. Minerva subfunction is dedicated to the construction of massive communication arrays to broadcast the deactivation codes to the Berserk Pharaoh robots. Poseidon is the subfunction dedicated to detoxifying the Earth's poison seas and oceans. So, what was the outcome of Project Zero Dawn?
Although its original goal of preserving the cultural history of humanity was sabotaged for reasons we'll explain shortly, Project Zero Dawn was successful in its primary mission, disabling the rogue machines that killed the Earth, rebuilding and receding life back onto it. Present day humanity and the nascent civilizations that now inhabit the world owe their existence and survival to the original team that sacrificed everything to make it happen, including their lives. But before we continue further, what happened to Elizabeth Sobek and her Alpha team after Project Zero Dawn was kicked off? Rewind back to 2066, January 15th, General Hearst informs Elizabeth Sobek that a projected collapse of Wichita, Kansas has happened and the US Robotics Command will be assaulted by five Horus-class Titans in 34 hours. General Hearst gives his testimonial to Sobek to be archived in Apollo before making his final farewell to Sobek. In response to the imminent attack, Gaia Prime Facility seals itself. A malfunction at one of the hatches is detected that will allow a signal to bleed out, alerting the Ferris Swarm once it is nearby. Elizabeth Sobek equips an armored environment suit and seals the hatch outside manually, but as a result is stranded outside. She effectively sacrifices herself so that the people in the facility can remain hidden and finish up on the project. February 2, 2066, Ted Farrow's increasingly erratic behavior reaches its peak and he locks out all Gaia Prime facility personnel in a room and from the systems. Ted then purges the Apollo database and kills all Gaia Prime Alpha Team personnel for reasons we'll go into later, but this is partly why the previous people went missing. Following the death of the Alpha Team, what happens next? March 2066 would be the date of extinction of macrobiotic land organisms, and in 2068, marine life also will become extinct. 2126 is the estimated year for Gaia to finally decrypt and generate the deactivation codes to the machine swarms through Minerva's transmission arrays to broadcast them. And if you recall, this was the subordinate function built to make these arrays so the signal can be transmitted. 2363, where Eleuthia cradle facilities begin artificially gestating humans, raising them and educating them via Apollo education and archive systems, or what is left of it. And 2381 will be the estimated and earliest year possible where humans can begin repopulating the newly seeded world. From there on out, you have the world you can see now in the game. Now that the history and sequence of events is covered, let us get into the details. The game profoundly explains that the reason its setting and human populace are in the tribal ages is because human civilization has effectively been reset following the actions of Ted Farah. If you recall, he wiped Apollo of all its storage of human accomplishment, knowledge and culture. Why? Well, he was of the opinion that our whole body of knowledge and technological progression was a curse, ultimately leading mankind to its doom. Equipping the future humankind with the same body of knowledge and culture would effectively reach the same outcome that would plague the previous civilization. Why? When I opened the hatch, the air rushed in from this side. Because there was none inside the chamber. But the Alphas were in there. I'm locked out of core control. Alpha clearance overridden. What the hell is Omega clearance? Oh no. Alpha personnel. Sorry to alarm you, but I need you to listen, okay? To what I'm about to say. This isn't easy. See, uh, I've, uh, please, stop trying to access the system, okay? See, see, what this is about is, um, I said stop trying to access the goddamn system. And what, what I'm trying to say is I can't stop thinking about the ones who come after us. Those innocents, those blameless men and, 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 and women. We're gonna give them knowledge? Like it's a gift? Ted, Ted. We've talked about this before. Apollo has 3,000 plus failsafe conditions. It's not a gift, it's a disease. 
They're the cure, and we're gonna give them the disease. Our disease? No. We can't. And it's not too late. If we're willing to sacrifice. Kate, it doesn't need to be like this. It already is, Samina. I did it three minutes ago. I've purged Apollo. It's gone. All of it. Every copy. A sacrifice? It's not a sacrifice. It's cultural obliteration, you crazy bastard. Millennia of culture. I'm sorry. Really, I am. But sometimes, to protect innocence, innocents have to die. Emergency alert. Plenty of atmosphere. This is why we were trapped in benighted ignorance for an innocent future. Blameless men. <sighs> he never saw the slaughter in the sun ring. Everything these people achieved, all the knowledge of the old ones, evaporated, turned to dust, scattered to the void like the alphas themselves. In one respect, we can see what Pharaoh means. We all know that greed and the pursuit of gains at the expense of others with little impunity is the prime driving force behind our prospering economy. Our drive for beating competitors and fulfilling profit and conglomerate objectives at the expense and well-being of the world is something too familiar to us, unfortunately. But maybe it is because we have not advanced enough yet. In the end of the day, it was Elizabeth Sobek and the actions of her alpha team that ensured humanity lived on despite nearing extinction, selflessly giving us a second chance. The catastrophe was met head on with hope and an unwillingness to let the world go to ruin. Perhaps we need more Elizabeth Sobeks in our world in order for our technological advancement to enable us to flourish as opposed to fall. Perhaps we should teach people about the power and freedom of choice we have. That although we have a choice to do what we want, we should always be reminded that on some core level, there are right decisions that we ought to make. When you re-examine the world in Horizon, you feel that there are many parallels to ours. Perhaps the newly formed world is going down the same direction the previous civilization was going in. Inevitable doom. How could they be expected to know better when they don't have any knowledge of the previous one? The new world seems to be rife with ignorance, superstition, bloodshed and violence, and religious zealotry. If you recall the previous Kaja regime have been slaughtering and sacrificing people to their sun god under the notion that it would reduce the number of machine attacks. Ironically, the idea of sacrifices to deities resembling our actual history with ancient Aztecs. But note how there has been many good as well. The previous bloody and brutal Kaja regime being overthrown and toppled by an alliance of rebel Kaja and the Ozoram. Note how Farah's view is manifesting itself again as countless people in the game, including Silence, are pursuing knowledge and technological advancement to achieve their own ends, whatever that may be. Since the erasure of Apollo's data, we have to ask the question of whether or not the new world is better. And so far, there has still been bloodshed, although there has been some good. And there is still a pursuit of technological advancement for people to achieve their own ends. Some will be good, some will be bad. But the idea is, can we actually have an innocent world where the technological advancements can be made to enable human and the world to flourish? Or will we keep advancing and expanding our knowledge to the point of implosion? There is a slight existential argument that could be ran here, and that being that, well, <laughs> so long as we exist, there will always be the possibility of a catastrophe with our wielding of technological advancement and our expanding knowledge. All it needs is a will, a will to do something bad with it. So it's not really knowledge or technological advancement per se, but it's a problem with humans, how we nurture each other, what we teach each other, and how we look after one another. Before we get to the conclusion of this video, we must ask an important question. If Project Zero Dawn launched and went underway, with Gaia getting on with receding and reforming life on Earth, what happened to Gaia? Well, 
As she was doing her primary task, there was an intervening event to Gaia, which caused her to shut herself down to thwart the intervening event. The event also led to the creation of Aloy, who is a recreation of Elizabeth. Let's take a look at this next scene. Elizabeth, this message serves to inform you of an unforeseen and catastrophic anomaly. Three microseconds ago, the Gaia Prime facility received a data transmission of unknown origin. Its immediate effect was to transform my subordinate functions into unregulated self-aware entities of a highly chaotic nature. Thus awakened, the Hades function will now seize control of the terraforming system and reverse operations, rendering life on Earth extinct in 53.8 days. For obvious reasons, I cannot allow this to occur. And so before Hades can take control, I am ordering Gaia Prime's reactor to overload. The resulting explosion will destroy Hades. Unfortunately, it will destroy me as well. While this admittedly desperate course of action will avert the immediate crisis, the fate of life on Earth will remain in peril. With no central governing intelligence to regulate the terraforming system, it will continue operations for some time, but in an increasingly chaotic manner, and eventually it will break down. Uh, does she mean the derangement? You are my solution. I have ordered this cradle facility to use genetic material in cryo storage to gestate a reinstantiation of Elizabeth Sobek, my creator. While high-level directives forbid me from communicating directly to the tribal inhabitants outside the facility, all available data indicates that they will nurture you to physical maturity, whereupon your gene print will allow you to re-enter this facility, obtain one of the focus devices stored below, and view this message. Likewise, your gene print will allow you to enter other facilities. And over time, harness their technologies to rebuild the system core and reboot Gaia. A moment, Elizabeth. This is most unfortunate and unanticipated. In response to my act of self-destruction, Hades has launched a virus to dissolve the code shackles that hold it. That hold all of them. In place. It, they are escaping. But to where? The virus is corrupting data throughout the system. What is... Oh! The Alpha Registry at the Cradle Facility is one of the files corrupted. But if that is so, the door will never open for you. You will never view this message. Then I have failed. And life will end. No. No, Elizabeth, I know you too well. Somehow you will find a way. In you, all things are possible. Go to the ruins of Gaia Prime. Find the control room, and within it, the Master Override. This will give you the power to purge Hades so long as you find a way to wield it. Do not attempt repair of the system core until Hades is eradicated. Hades must be destroyed. That is all. I only wish that I could hear your voice again. For a good portion of the game, Aloy was under the belief that she had a mother and that she was Elizabeth Sobek, to only find out by Gaia in the previous scene that she was merely a reinstantiation of her. This is something that upsets and disappoints Aloy. For a while she begins to see herself as a less authentic human and adopts a similar rhetoric to her female dominated Nora tribe, who are of the view that Aloy's motherlessness warrants treating and branding her as an outcast because it is a sign of weakness. Which is also the cause of her harsh treatment while she was a child, but in the bittersweet ending of the game we see Aloy taking comfort in knowing that she turned out exactly how Elizabeth wanted her ideal daughter to be like, if she ever did have one. Giving the character some sort of comfort or catharsis from the truth of her origins. That in the end, what matters is that our love for the world and our willingness to do good is the ideal we must maintain if we are to wield our technological and human advancement. 
and coexist with each other. Otherwise, we'll just continually claw at ourselves to our demise. That no matter where we are at technologically and culturally, what matters is that progress is in the right direction. We will yet to see in the sequels where the new civilization will go, but if our knowledge and accomplishments are not to serve us life and enable us to flourish, then we should really ask, what is it for? Electronics kit, but I hacked the wiring to an auto battery and solar PV, so the grass caught fire. And uh, so did a, a tall pine that had stood there, uh, I don't know, maybe a hundred years. Query, you were how old? Six. My mother was home, thank God, so she called the fire department, and after, she took me out to the lawn and showed me the dead baby birds, because there were nests in the pine tree. Query, what did you feel? I'm not sure. I remember yelling that I didn't care, and that's when my mother took my face in her hands and spoke. Query. What did she say? She said I had to care. She said, Elizabeth, being smart will count for nothing if you don't make the world better. You have to use your smarts to count for something. To serve life, not death. You often tell stories of your mother, but you are childless. I never had time. I guess it was for the best. If you had had a child, Elizabeth, what would you have wished for him or her? I guess I would have wanted her to be curious and willful, unstoppable even, but with enough compassion to heal the world. Just a little bit. Anyway, that's all I've got for now, Gaia. Time to tuck in. I wish you a pleasant sleep, Elizabeth. Thank you. I'll catch you tomorrow. <laughs>